Hello, what's up, y'all? It's Poppin' It's D-Boss here. I this bit by Nick Crowley. This is the darkest moments in TV history. Uh-oh. See how dark this gets? Let's watch. It was a typical day in the world of daytime television. Oh, he don't talk so. I'm confused with somebody else. scripted legal shows filled viewer screens, with one of the more popular at the time being a program called Christina's Court. Today. Some dark Christina's Christina's court? Court? I never seen The show centered around a woman either. named Christina Perez, giving counsel and advice to those wrapped up in legal drama. And on this particular morning, comedian Sean Harris would be featured filing suit against his ex-girlfriend in the hopes of recouping unpaid rent. Every month it would be something different, you know? Like what? I ain't got this month because I had to do this or that. And I'm like, man. So you let her go nine months without paying her? Now, like I said, these shows were very obviously scripted, at least to some degree. And with Sean himself being a professional comedian, it led to countless funny moments and what turned out to be one of the show's more iconic episodes. With by far the most memorable moment coming at the very end, when things seemed to deviate from the script. Constantly like a child in my own house. Oh, that's true. Ask him he's been married for how long? Over 20 Look at him though, he look mad. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Watch. Mm hmm. He apparently wasn't. Oh, that's right. Oh, that's Here, we see the comedian take aim at Christina's bailiff, a man named Renard Spivey, who was an integral part of the show, being the judge's sidekick for years and years. Though it wasn't oh, often that he found himself at the end of a joke like this, as Sean suggests that Renard looked unhappy when it was revealed that he had been married for over 27 years. He's very happy. Okay, all right, let's get back to the point. All in all, it made for a rather charming moment, with viewers adoring the lighthearted jab aimed at one of the show's most beloved characters. Though no one could have known at the time just how true that joke about his happy marriage would turn out to be. Still developing tonight, a Harris County Sheriff's deputy facing serious charges. 63-year-old Renard Spivey accused of killing his wife, 52-year-old Patricia Spivey, after an argument that turned deadly. KPRC challenges Bill Barano. On July 28, 2019, over a decade after the aforementioned program aired, Renard Spivey was confronted by his wife, Patricia, about what she believed to be steroid use or perhaps even infidelity. And in the midst of this heated argument, Spivey would draw his gun and shoot his wife once in the arm and then in the chest. What? Shortly after, police would find her lifeless body crumpled in their bedroom closet. Now, after years and years of taking part in this once famed legal show, Spivey can be found alone in his prison cell, where he'll likely remain for the next 14 years of his life, for murdering the woman that he was so happily married to, turning what was once one of Christina's court's most iconic moments into one of the darkest examples of irony in all of television history. Oh my god. When you find a good woman, you got to hang on for dear life. Is that it's hard to find another one. My advice is a happy woman, married woman. Oh, Before we get any further, I want to thank Scentford for sponsoring this video yeah, and in turn it. making this dark content. It'd be a divorce if you're not happy. Just get out of there, brother. So you're not shooting nobody. The world of television is an interesting one. Despite the highly controlled and well-polished products that we're typically used to seeing on our screens, there have been a surprisingly high number of deeply disturbing moments that have happened when on air, and this potentially new series aims to highlight some of the most disturbing. And what better way to start than with a relatively unknown case that has haunted me for years? Oh, Saturday, June 14, 2008, a Japanese TV station called Television Miyazaki is running its standard live programming, which on this day was set to feature a game show-like segment in the remote rice fields of Takachi Hocho. The game itself was simple. 
competitors stood back to back on a small wooden stand above the shallow muddy water below. And when given the cue, they would attempt to shove their opponent into the water without turning their bodies around. In the end, the one left standing on the platform would be declared the winner, with the loser being left humiliated in the mud. <laughs> Round one goes off without a hitch, resulting in the losing contestant being covered head to toe in a thick brown sludge, with the whole atmosphere perfectly encapsulating the craziness and high energy charm that you would expect from a Japanese game show made at the time. Show and so far, everything was all in good fun. With this excitement only escalating as the contestants convince one of the show's hosts, a man named Tasuchi Yanagida, to join in on the competition. <laughs> It took some convincing, but eventually Tetsuchi agrees to compete, much to the enjoyment of everyone spectating. Uh -oh. And from there, the comedy writes itself, as immediately after the round starts, it's apparent that he stood little to no chance. Look at his thing. You want the killer, bro? And upon instantly losing his balance, Tetsuki reacts in a split second and dives off the platform, landing head first into the muddy water below, which causes his body to fall limp. The water that he had just dove into was merely six inches deep, with the rest consisting of a he thick layer of mud, which his head would strike directly, instantly causing his neck to break. And in that very moment, Tatsuchi would be irreversibly paralyzed, leaving him unable to move from the neck down. No. It was a tragic accident. However, the accident itself is far from the most awful part of this live broadcast, with that coming immediately after. Unaware of Tatsuchi's severe injury, the crew believed that he was merely playing a prank on them and just joking around, and so they left him there face first in the water, and proceeded to shove his face even deeper and deeper into the mud, splashing even more on top of his head to rub in the fact that he had lost. What the fuck? They had no idea that during their antics, Hasuchi was in a desperate fight for survival, as in those six inches of water, he was slowly drowning and completely unable to pick up his head to breathe. This lasts for an excruciatingly long 15 seconds before they begin to bob his head up and down and eventually pull Tasuchi's face out of the water. But this reprieve was short-lived as the contestants proceed to drop him back into the mud face first. Are y'all stupid? It is so incredibly painful to watch, and made all the more disturbing with the over-the-top hysterical laughter coming from everyone around him who are completely oblivious to the situation in front of them. Finally, after what feels like an eternity, oh Tasuchi is hoisted above the water and the camera switched back to the main broadcast, ending both Tasuchi's and the viewer's pain. By some stroke of good fortune, Tasuchi would survive the ordeal, but just barely, as it's estimated that even just a few more seconds in that mud would have likely led to his death. But thankfully, this wasn't the case. And according to his Facebook page, Tasuchi has learned to live with his body-wide paralysis, and even went on to rejoin the show years later in some capacity, breaks. ending this entry off on somewhat of a off bright you spot. Bitches. Despite this otherwise being one of the more unsettling and appalling broadcast accidents that I've ever seen. Oh my goodness. I mean, he did agree, but what the fuck? What the fuck? Damn. That's fucked up. On the topic of broadcasts that have left an impression on my life, I would say none have had more of an emotional impact than a story run by 60 Minutes about a man named Donald Herbert. The story starts back in 1995, just four days after Christmas, when a fire broke out in a home in Buffalo, New York. Is this what, uh, Ladder 41? 49? Was based off of? Because I heard that was based off a true story, that movie. 
In an attempt to put out the blaze, firefighter Donald Herbert was standing on the roof of the building when and suddenly ball. it gave way. Mm -hmm. As a result, mm -hmm. Herbert would fall into the this. attic where he would be trapped Great in the movie. smoke, unable to breathe. He would lay there without oxygen for six whole minutes before they finally were able to pull his body to safety, with the whole ordeal being filmed and shown on local news. Somehow, Herbert what? managed to survive this accident, but being without air for that long caused him he to lose most of his brain function, leading to him spending the following years in a minimally conscious state, unable to what? eat, unable to breathe, and seemingly unable to understand the world around him. Eventually, his condition led to him being placed in a nursing home, where a feeding tube was the only thing keeping him alive. Mm. For all intents and purposes, the man was gone. But then, something happened. On April 20th, 2005, a staggering nine and a half years after his accident, Donald Herbert woke up. In the nursing home where he had spent most of the years unresponsive, he would suddenly turn to a nurse and ask for his wife, Linda, while displaying signs of being fully lucid, which prompted the staff to immediately call his family who rushed to see him. And sure enough, despite Herbert being completely blind, he was not only fully responsive, but recognized almost all of his family members. Aww. The moments following were all captured by cameras and later shown on an episode of 60 Minutes, with the footage being some of the hardest hitting and emotional that I've personally ever seen. The pain in discovering Ooh. that he had been gone I cried on ladder for you now. All the time missed, robbed from a man who was just doing his job, is indescribably gut-wrenching. But it's what happens after this footage that proves to be the most upsetting part. For nearly 16 hours, the newly awakened man spoke with his mm -hmm. family, catching up on every little detail that he had missed. And though from that point on, he had moments going in and out of his lucidity, his long-term prognosis actually seemed hopeful. Throughout the next few weeks, Donald was surrounded by family members at all times, not only to take advantage of every single second that Herbert was awake, but also for his own safety as well. As since his awakening, he would thrash violently in his sleep, as if he still believed he was trapped in that blaze. Aww. And so to ensure his safety, at least one family member would be stationed with the man while he slept. Though on one night, one of the family members on duty had grown too exhausted to stay any longer. And from the first time since he became lucid, Donald Herbert was left alone. And during that night, he would again start to thrash violently, with Herbert flailing so hard that he would fall out of his bed and strike his head against the floor, <gasps> causing his brain to start bleeding. No. From that moment on, Donald Herbert would never become lucid again. And as a result of his injuries, he would pass away one year later from pneumonia. That is so fucking sad. If anyone has ever thought that such a horrendous thing could happen, obviously we would have stopped. Oh, shit. I the Twilight, Twilight Zone. Zone. Throughout its lengthy run, this television series provided some of the most entertaining and memorable moments in all of television. But for this section, yeah, I'm going to be cheating a little bit. As rather than looking at an event surrounding the show itself, I'll be highlighting the far less memorable movie version of the series. Simply named Twilight Zone the Movie, the film was broken up into multiple sections serving as sort of an anthology work with three separate storylines. And for the sake of this story, only one section and really only one scene bears discussion. The scene was intended to simulate a battle in the Vietnam War, in which the protagonist, a character played by actor Vic Morrow, is attempting to outrun an attack helicopter and escape the area. The footage was intended to serve as the section's dramatic conclusion, with it being described as the following. In the scene that served as the original ending, Bill, the character portrayed by Morrow, stumbles into a deserted Vietnamese village, where he finds two young Vietnamese children left behind when a U.S. Army helicopter appears and begins shooting at them. Yeah. Morrow was to take both children under his arm and escape out of the village as the hovering helicopter destroyed the village with multiple explosions. Based on that description alone, shooting the scene was going to be tricky and likely a very intense process on the set, as all the effects used were set to be done practically, meaning that they would require an actual helicopter and real pyrotechnics. 
Not only this, but the director, a man named John Landis, wanted to use actual child actors for the scene, mm. which given that it was planned to take place at night and near mm. explosions, was technically mm. illegal in the state of California. Yeah, no. Despite the laws in place, however, Landis yeah. decided to shoot the scene regardless, enlisting oh. seven-year-olds Mika Din Lee and six-year-olds Renee Xin Yi Chen to oh. play the roles of the Vietnamese children. And with all the pieces now in place, the cameras began to roll on what was set to be the stunning conclusion to this particular section. As the scene starts, the spectacle of it all can't be understated, as the lighting, setting, and the pyrotechnics truly set a haunting tone. However, unbeknownst to the production team, there was a major problem developing. As stated prior, all the effects you see here are real, and during the scene there was an actual helicopter flying just above the actors, which by itself was already very dangerous, right. and made even more so due to the pyrotechnics. For the pilots, the explosions launched in the air created fireballs in the sky, making things much more difficult to navigate, but those on the ground were never made aware of this. And being pressed to make things look even more and more intense, the crew decided to double down on their explosions, launching two massive charges back to back. A decision that proved to be a costly one, as the second blast was so strong that it dislodged the helicopter's tail prop, causing the craft to spin uncontrollably. And within mere seconds, as the cameras roll on the three actors trudging their way through the water, craft crashes directly on top of them. <gasps> Somehow, everyone on board the helicopter survived the wreck, though those on the ground weren't so lucky, as in one split second, the blade of the helicopter slashed into Vic Morrow and Mika Din Lee, <gasps> instantly decapitating them. And as the craft slammed to the ground, Renee Shin Yi Chen would be crushed beneath its massive weight. In one frame, there were three living actors, and in the next, there were none. Oh my god. In retrospect, it's not hard to see the red flags and the dangerous practices being used by the production I team. That. However, following several long legal battles, no one would be found liable in the deaths of the three actors. What? Landis himself would go on to enjoy an incredibly successful career. What? The Twilight Zone film would eventually be released years later, only with a different ending. Are you fucking serious? Oh, this world is fucked. There's nobody a common here. Nobody was found liable. Fuck yeah. Our final story takes us to the quaint countryside of Buttsfield, England, where a man named Elbert Dryden had been living a fairly solitary life. Following his retirement from steelworking, Albert dedicated his life to building up a plot of land which he had purchased in the area. His main goal was to construct a bungalow for his elderly mother where she could live during the summers, while also planning to build some sort of fallout bunker on the same plot. But right from the start, he ran into issues, as his permit request to build these structures on his land was promptly denied. This did not stop Dryden, however, as despite the ruling, he began his construction anyway, believing he had found a workaround with the law, as rather than building the house in a standard manner, he instead dug a deep hole into the ground and began to construct his home there, labeling it as the home in a hole. Due to this, the home only stood about eight feet or so above the ground, which Dryden believed made the construction legal. However, he was wrong in his assumption, and the building swiftly caused a disagreement between the man and the Derwentside District Council, with this rift growing more and more amplified as time went on. In the midst of this ordeal, a man named Harry Collinson was appointed as chief of the council and assigned to handle the case as his first order of business. And he did so by initially sending Dryden a letter demanding that he stop construction and also tear down what he had already built. Dryden, however, decided to counter with a court appeal, which was swiftly denied, leading to the court's final order that the building be demolished within three months. It was around the same time that the local news began to document the ongoing feud between Dryden and the government, and despite the numerous rulings against him, Dryden still refused to give in to the government's demands, and eventually, the council decided to take matters into their own hands, and decided to demolish the structure themselves. So on June 20th, 1991, Harry Collinson, a demolition team, and a group of police constables traveled to Dryden's property to demolish the structure. 
Before this group arrived, the decision was made that should Dryden attempt to escalate the situation, they were to immediately back off and come up with another plan to avoid any sort of physical altercation. At the scene, numerous reporters had already began gathering at the property line, including a cameraman for the BBC, who was there to document the feud in real time. And right from the start, it was clear that Dryden was not going to be going down without a fight. The gate to his property was chain-locked, with Dryden standing behind it, pointing to two letters that he believed proved that he should be able to keep his structure intact, at least for the time being. Read that like an official letter and there's an appeal in. There's an inspector coming up on this plate and find this well, all that I'm asking is to be five weeks at the outcome, maybe six weeks. It'll take a week after he's been out. I'm satisfied now that there's nothing in these documents that affects the legality yeah. of the enforcement or just that the inspector has concerns. However, Dryden's request for more time was clearly falling on deaf ears. And realizing this, Dryden began to grow more and more agitated, with his tone quickly turning far more menacing. If you don't open the gate, now, we'll have to, we'll obviously have to take the fence down with some feet. So, if you want, you can have some time to remove the fence yourself to minimize the damage. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Any damage that's subsequently caused as a result of you preventing us doing that is, will be your liability. Well, you might not be around to see the outcome of this Ooh. disaster. Now, you've been warned. Well, I'm not going to explain, but if you had any sense, you would go away now. And we have five weeks for the outcome of that. Right? That's the last word on it. Mr. Fisher, the letter. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I can't show you the letter. Yes, I'm just told you where the letter is. At this point, based on their initial plan, the crew should have certainly turned back as he was now getting to the point that Dryden was outright threatening Collinson, warning him that if he were to step on his property, that something awful was going to happen. And though this did cause Collinson to take a few steps back, he still remained steadfast in carrying out the task and remained on the edge of the property line, standing his ground even when Dryden escalates the situation even further. God, I told you. Where, where, where As the two stand face to face, Dryden brandishes his pistol and points it directly at Collinson. And wanting to ensure the man's combative behavior was being documented, Collinson asks the cameraman to get a shot of his gun, which subsequently leads to this moment. And he got a shot of this gun. Why are y'all so calm? In an instant, with cameras rolling, Dryden fires a shot directly into the chest of Harry Collinson, and then fires another at the crowd standing before him, leading to things devolving into a chaotic scene of running and screaming. As more shots were fired from a pistol, the camera crew and Look North reporter Tony Belmont ran for cover. We were standing, we were standing watching what was going on. These niggas looked at the gun like, oh, get this on camera. Oh, this nigga got a gun. Ha, he think he about to do something. What? I, I, I would have immediately got out of there when he was holding it. He wouldn't even have to. And then uh, a shot rang out at the chief gunner, fell to the ground, and I, uh, I heard, felt a shot in the arm, and I've clearly been shot here in the arm. As the camera crew finally gets to a safe distance and catches their breath, it's revealed that one of the journalists for the BBC had been struck in the arm, along with one of the officers. Though in the midst of all this carnage, we see no sign of Harry Collinson. Damn. As by this point, he was likely still on the ground where he had originally fallen, dead from his gunshot wound, Damn. with his final words being, And he got a shot at this gun. Why didn't y'all Following the incident, that police would engage in a standoff with Dryden, who claimed that he had set up booby traps and landmines, along with other explosives on the property, though this would turn out to be a bluff, and eventually he would be grabbed by officers and taken into custody, where he would subsequently be tried and sentenced to life in prison. And despite his actions on that day, Albert Dryden would go on to become somewhat of a national hero, growing a legitimate fan base for the way he stood up yeah, against the government. No, but you Dryden would live out his time in prison until 2017 Dracula when he suffered a massive stroke. 
to which he was let out on a compassionate release, with a man eventually passing away just one year later. Though his actions they that day will forever be immortalized release. as one of the most notorious and darkest moments in television history. Sheesh. Not sure why they were trying to paint him as a hero. Sure, you sit up to the government, but you kill somebody in the process. The fuck? This man was just doing his job. Like, that's not right. <laughs> They're crazy. And then they let him out because he had a stroke. Okay? People got health conditions. Take your ass back to jail. But, I mean, he passed, uh, you know, a year later. R.I.P. But you can't be out here just shooting niggas. Um, this was crazy. This was really, really interesting. Very dark. For sure. Y'all let me know what y'all thought, though. Let me know what other videos you want me to watch, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye!